Well, um, let's try to write uh, the mechanism for this reaction. I think this is pretty much what you guys had, uh, had worked out here. So again, we have a water nucleophile, it comes in, and I guess we were saying that we're going to save the deprotonation for the end here, it's most convenient. Um, we don't need to protonate this to get it to leave, because again, this is an excellent leaving group. It's an excellent leaving group because it's resonance stabilized, as we already discussed. We don't need, so again, we don't need any, any, any catalysts here. We don't need any catalysts, and that's why this reaction was almost the same as the acyl halide. These are all both very simple reactions that don't need special conditions, because they both have outstanding leaving groups. So we don't need any uh, catalysts, so there's fewer protonation or deprotonation steps. Uh, so we reform the carbonyl by kicking off uh, the leaving group. I'll keep asterisking the elements of the carbonyl, so we don't lose track of those. And then we use the leaving group to deprotonate the original nucleophile over here. That gave us uh, these as our products. Because that was the only part I didn't get. I didn't know what to use to deprotonate it. So you should use the leaving group to protonate the... To deprotonate over here. Oh, sorry. That's, what we're that's right. This is the same that we did in the last reaction with the acyl halide. We left the deprotonation until the end so that we could use the right. leaving group to deprotonate. Okay. And that's what we're doing here. Uh, so this should remind you uh, a lot of the previous reaction. It's a little more confusing because this is a more confusing looking functional group. But if you just treat this whole big thing as an L, you can see it's pretty much the same reaction. So the key thing is to identify in your mind, this is the L. If you keep track of that, the reaction is not too confusing. Um, so what type of functional groups did we start with here? What type of functional group is this? And that's this one here? An yeah, this is an anhydride, right? Remember, we were just going through the reaction where we attack an anhydride. Do you see why this is called an anhydride and not an ester? Or not? not really. Right, so the R here should really stand for a kind of a normal carbon chain, not for a carbonyl containing carbon chain. Or at least the carbon that's directly connected to the oxygen should just be a normal, uninteresting, boring carbon. So uh, when we use this symbol R, the convention is that the R stands for a, a boring alkane carbon with no, fun with no other interesting functional groups on it. But the Whereas in the anhydride, the oxygen is connected to a carbonyl carbon. Okay. Maybe I shouldn't be using all these general terms. Here would be an example. So what type of functional group is this? An ester. Yeah, so maybe I should have just drawn an actual ester instead of always using R here. So this, this R here is supposed to stand for compounds like this, um, where we just have a boring carbon that doesn't have any interesting functional groups directly attached to it on the oxygen.
why, why is it important to have different names for whether uh, there's a carbonyl here or not? The reason why it's important to have different names for those is when there's a carbonyl here, that gives us resonance stabilization. Whereas if there's no carbonyl, there's not going to be resonance stabilization, and therefore the reactivity is different. So we want to give different names to things with different reactivity. Uh, to finish off with this reaction here, we attack it in a hydride with water. What types of functional groups did we end up with? Two carboxylic acids. Yeah, carboxylic acids. So anhydride plus water gives you car uh, two carboxylic acids. Again, you really shouldn't have to memorize that. You should be able to figure it out by just going through the mechanism, like we just did over here. But again, if you're doing a synthesis and you want to make a carboxylic acid, well, this is one good way to make the carboxylic acid. Yeah, we need to talk about that uh, for a minute or two more. There is a special name for this type of reaction here. Um, this type of reaction here is called hydrolysis. This is a very important type of reaction here. Geology uses hydrolysis. Yeah. I want to ask, but right. kind of embarrassing. Now, there's many different examples of hydrolysis. This is just one example. What does hydrolysis mean? Well, obviously, hydro refers to water, right? Hydro and hydrolysis is water. But what does lysis mean? Lysis means breaking. If you, uh, if you remember the term from biology, when a cell lyses, that's because it's bursting or breaking. So hydrolysis means breaking into two pieces by adding water. And you're going to be seeing lots of reactions for the whole rest of the semester where you're breaking things into two pieces by adding water. This is one of the key reactions in biochemistry as well. When the, uh, in um, catabolism, is that the right pronunciation? In catabolism, when the body is breaking down um, polymers, it does that by adding water to break those down. So polysaccharides are broken into uh, into monosaccharides by hydrolysis, or polypeptides are broken into amino acids by hydrolysis. In fact, we'll be studying that reaction when you get to proteins in a week or two here. All right, so hydrolysis is definitely a key reaction here, and it means adding water to break a bond. What type of bond are we breaking? Well, we're always, at, uh, at this point of the course, we're always going to be breaking the carbonyl L bond. So we need to keep our eye on that carbonyl L bond. We're using the water to break the carbonyl L bond. Remember, the L can be any of these groups over here. We're using the water to break that carbonyl L bond. So this is just one example of hydrolysis where you're hydrolyzing in a hydride. But we can, uh, we can hydrolyze an ester or an amide or pretty much any of these as well. Water breaks, you said? The bond between the carbonyl and that L group, that wild card. Here's all the different L groups that we've seen, right? It could yeah. be a halogen, or this, or an OR, or an NH2. Carbonyl L group. Yeah. In fact, we'll, we'll see more examples as we go. So that's why there's many different examples of hydrolysis, because there's many different L groups that you can break the bond with. So it helps to put it in the squiggle so you can see what bond we're breaking. Um, it's important to be able to go through the mechanism for hydrolysis, but it's also important to be able to get the correct products without doing the whole mechanism. Because on the final, you're gonna, he's going to give you problems where there are maybe five of these bonds, and then he's going to want you to hydrolyze them all. Well, it would take you the whole test if you went through the mechanism for all of those. So it's important to know how to hydrolyze it just in your head. Well, what happened here? Notice what, what happened to the H2O. Well, the OH group went here. The OH went here. And this hydrogen eventually ended up on the leading group. The water, so here's the water that attacked. Here's the water that attacked. Well, the water, just like we talked earlier about how alcohols have to deprotonate after they act as nucleophiles, well, water also has to deprotonate after it acts like a nucleophile. Otherwise, it can't get rid of the positive charge. So the water eventually doesn't look like water anymore. It looks like hydroxide, almost. Eventually, the water just looks like an OH. What happened to this proton? The leaving group took it. The leaving group ended up taking this additional proton uh, over here. So the water, uh, and this, this is an excellent example, again, of how the water has broken the, L, has broken the bond between the leaving group and uh, the carbonyl. These two atoms used to be connected to each other, but now the water has gotten in between them. These two are the ones that used to be connected, but now the elements of the water has gotten in between them over here. Okay, um, and again, so how do you make a carboxylic acid? Well, you attack one of these things with water. And it's hard for people to think of that because this doesn't look like water anymore because it's deprotonated. But it used to look like water before it deprotonated. Just like an alcohol doesn't look like an alcohol as much after it deprotonates, water doesn't look like water as much after it deprotonates. So we have to just know that uh, when this originally attacked the carbonyl, it had additional hydrogen and it looked like water. So that's important when you're doing syntheses. Okay, and you're definitely going to be doing a bunch of uh, hydrolyses uh, in the class. All right, so this is our basic idea of uh, using hydrolysis 